We'll be looking at the book of Acts, chapter 13. If you don't have a Bible, please stick up your hand, and Dave uh, will get you one. And in the white and blue Bibles that he's passing out, uh, Acts, chapter 13, can be found on page 599. That's the passage that we'll be looking at. So as you're finding Acts chapter 13, uh, just to announce for those of you that haven't heard, uh, Rick and Catherine, um, they had a baby a couple days ago, a healthy baby by the name of Abigail. So we just are rejoicing and thankful uh, for that. So do pass on your congratulations to them next time you see them. Well, they'll have a baby then, so you'll know. (laughs) But um, anyway, welcome to the world, baby Abigail. So uh, that's what's going on um, baby-wise. And... What we're going to be doing is uh, we're going to be looking at uh, the story of the resurrection of Jesus, uh, and we're going to be looking at it rather than looking at it as we usually do for the past 10 Easter's, for as long as I've been preaching here, um, we tend to look at those chapters at the end of the gospel narratives, the end of Matthew, the end of Mark, the end of Luke, the end of John, and uh, like I said, I've been doing that for 10 years. And uh, as I was preparing for this one, I was thinking, okay, well, there's more to say about the resurrection of Jesus Christ uh, than what Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John have to say. And so what I was doing uh, in my own private study, devotionally, just for myself, I was just skimming through uh, the book of Acts. And I was noticing how many times the apostles uh, brought forth this great triumphant news that Jesus Christ has risen from the dead. And as I was reading it, just for my own sake, I, I read chapter 13 and it really struck me. And I thought, this is Easter. This is my Easter sermon. And so in Acts chapter 13, uh, we're going to look at a sermon from the Apostle Paul. Uh, in fact, trivia, this is the first time that we have a sermon from the Apostle Paul in the whole book of Acts. And so this is probably not his first sermon ever, but this is the first one that's recorded for us. And so as we listen to him present the gospel, uh, I believe it's just going to be so instructive, so encouraging, so helpful for us here on this Easter Sunday uh, here in Cork. So I prayed for the kids beforehand, but I'm just going to pray for us, and then let's begin looking at Acts chapter 13. So, Father in heaven, we are celebrating just such good news. Um, Lord, as we hear um, Paul uh, speak about how great of news this is, and we read about the great response um, that the gospel heralding had um, uh, in his day, Father, may you just prompt a response. Um, Lord, here among us, Lord, here in this congregation, here in this gathering together, um, would you just cause the the gospel to go uh, deeper into our hearts and minds, Lord? Would you just enlighten uh, us, Lord? Literally, would you shine your light uh, upon us? Um, Father, that's our request. That's our hope. We ask that in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so uh, we actually have quite a bit of verses to cover, and so uh, I'm not going to be going as in-depth or as involved as sometimes I'm prone to do. Uh, We're just going to look at some of the things that the Apostle Paul thought was very, very important. Uh, He is in this region. Um, You can look at um, Acts chapter 13, verse 13. I'm going to read there, and then we're going to begin looking at his content. Uh, Now Paul and his companions set sail from Paphos and came to Perga in Pamphylia. And John left them and returned to Jerusalem. But they went on from Perga and came to Antioch in Pisidia. And then on the Sabbath day, they went into a synagogue and sat down. After the reading from the law and the prophets, the rulers of the synagogue sent a message to them saying, Brothers, if you have any word of encouragement for the people, say it. And so here we see uh, the Apostle Paul and his traveling companion Barnabas are journeying from city to city. And as their custom was, they would go on the Sabbath day, on Saturday, to the Jewish synagogue. And they'd say that's a good launching part, launching point for mission and for ministry. It's people who were used to hearing about God's great acts in the past. And they had wonderful news to tell them about what God has done in the present. 
And so as Paul and Peter, they perhaps sit in the back row and they're listening. Uh, well, they get a message. Uh, this is a custom of the time when they would have uh, visitors, uh, learned, educated visitors. Perhaps they heard about Paul's um, rabbinic training uh, that he'd received under the famous scholar and rabbi Gamaliel. They said, well, what am I doing preaching? Let's have, let's have our guest preach. And so they sent word to Paul, like on the spot, and said, could you share with us something encouraging? And you can imagine Paul, like the corners of his lips just turn up. He's like, have I got something encouraging for you? I have the most encouraging news ever. I'm going to tell you about what God has done in Christ. And so, verse 16, so Paul stood up and he motioned with his hand. And I love it because I talk with my hands. And it's like, hey, so does Paul. Paul taught motions with his hands as well. So I feel, I feel authorized and affirmed right here. Anyway, men of Israel and you who fear God, listen. The God of this people Israel chose our fathers and made the people great during their stay in the land of Egypt. With an uplifted arm, he led them out of it. And for about 40 years, he put up with them in the wilderness. And after destroying seven nations and the land of Canaan, he gave them their land as an inheritance. All of this took about 450 years. And after that, he gave them judges until Samuel the prophet. Then they asked for a king. And God gave them Saul the son of Kish, a man of the tribe of Benjamin, for 40 years. And when he had removed him, he raised up David to be their king, of whom he testified and said, I have found in David, the son of Jesse, a man after my heart, who will do all of my will. Of this man's offspring, God has brought to Israel a savior, Jesus, as he had promised. So in verses 16 to 23 that I just read, uh, the Apostle Paul begins by giving this history of Israel. He recounts to them their shared story. Uh, and he just does some important milestones about what God has done to bless them, to protect them, to guide them, and to govern them. And these are the highlights of, of it. He talks about the calling of the patriarchs in the book of Genesis. He talks about the rescue of the people from the land of Egypt out of slavery, which is the book of Exodus. He references the giving of the land to them which is recorded for us in the book of Joshua. He speaks about giving them judges. What book is that in? The book of Judges. Yes, great. We're all involved here. It's good. Um, and, and of course, he mentions Samuel the prophet, Saul the king, and then King David who came after. What book is that? Yes, great. It's the one that we're studying. Yeah, most, most Sunday mornings. Yeah, so we see that he recounts basically from Genesis up until the installation of King David, the ideal king, the king that's after God's own heart. And then from there, all of this is familiar to the people. You can see them nodding. You can see them maybe even finishing um, his sentences uh, because they've heard this before. They know what God's done in Genesis up until the time of the kingdom. But then here, in verse 23, he kind of pivots. He turns on this hinge. You see, God had promised David that his descendants would always sit on the throne. That, that there would be a son of David who forever rules God's people. Uh, that from age to age... There would be a son of David who is the anointed king and that he would rule with glory, honor, and power and authority. And, and then Paul says, and you know what? That has come to pass. That's come to pass in the son of David, Jesus Christ. His name is Jesus. This is the son of David. And so in this brief summary of all of the Old Testament, it's just a few verses, uh, we see that, that God is on the move in the history of Israel, and he has what I call this Christward trajectory, that he has a plan, and the plan goes way back. And the plan is to prepare a people to bring the Savior of the world into the planet Earth. And so we see that he has this commitment, and through all of their wanderings, and through all of their wonderings, 
um, throughout all of their times of confidence and throughout all the times of questioning, he was arranging things for what the Apostle Paul says elsewhere is the fullness of time, the time when he's ready to send his son, Jesus Christ. And so we see this Christward trajectory. And then we come to Christ, to the point of it. Where we see, I'll read again verse 23. It's worth repeating. And then we're going to read about the life and the death and the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. This goes from verse 23 down to verse 37. I'm not going to read this whole passage. I'm going to read the beginning of this. And I just give this to you as homework uh, to, to read the rest of this. Uh, in verse 23 and following, it says this. Of this man's offspring, King David, God has brought to Israel a savior, Jesus, as he promised. Before his coming, John had proclaimed a baptism of repentance to all the people of Israel. And as John was finishing his course, he said, Now, what do you suppose that I am? I'm not he. No, but behold, after me one is coming, the sandal of whose feet I am not worthy to tie. Brothers, sons of the family of Abraham, and those among you who fear God, to us has been sent the message of this salvation. For those who live in Jerusalem and their rulers, because they did not recognize him, nor understand the utterance of the prophets, which are read every Sabbath, fulfilled them by condemning him. And though they found in him no guilt worthy of death, they asked Pilate to have him executed. And when they had carried out all that was written of him, they took him down from the tree and they laid him in the tomb. Verse 30, happy Easter, but God raised him from the dead. And for many days he appeared to those who had come up with him from Galilee to Jerusalem and who are now his witnesses to the people. And we bring you the good news that what God promised to the fathers, he has fulfilled to us, their children, by raising Jesus. And then we see here this Old Testament references that confirm his point. But so in this section, so he began by saying, this is our shared history of God raising up rescuers and leaders for us. And then he says, the ultimate rescuer, leader has come, the son of David, Jesus Christ. And he describes some things about him, things that they need to know, things that you need to know about Jesus. And firstly, it's that he is the son of David. We've already covered that. It's this title. It's this promise. It's about this, this life, um, this everlasting king that would come, the son of David, and his name is Jesus. Also, we read that he is greater than John the Baptist. Now, now John the Baptist is this um, very, very well-known prophet of his day. Uh, he was able to draw a huge crowd. He was maybe one of the first mega pastors, I guess, in the, in the history of, of the church. He's able to draw people from all over. He was out in the rural wilderness, and people would leave the comfort of their homes to listen to this guy, John, yell at them and tell them to repent of their sins. And then he would dunk them under the water. But people kept coming because th there was this great uh, call on his life to do this. Well, anyway, it's been said of him that amongst those born of women, there is none greater than John the Baptist. You know, which is another way of saying he's just the best guy in the world. You know, that's my, my paraphrase of this. There's no one better than him. He's the best guy in all the world. But, and uh, Josephus, who was a Jewish historian writing about this time, he has a, a lengthy paragraph uh, describing John the Baptist his reach, his influence, and the historian Josephus has this to say about him. He just says, he was a good man. And I love that. He kind of like breaks out of historian mode and he makes a comment about the character of John and says, he was a good man. And so here we though, we see that by John's own admittance, he's nothing compared to Jesus. He says, I'm not worthy even to bend down and to untie his sandal. So firstly, we see he's the son of David. Secondly, we see that he's greater than John the Baptist. And thirdly, verse 27 says that he is spoken of by the prophets that were read week after week after week in the Sabbath synagogue meetings. And as I said earlier, and as I firmly believe, all of the history of Israel is on this Christ word trajectory 
doesn't it make sense that there would be hints, that there would be promises, that there'd be foretellings, that there'd be foreshadowings and, and prophecies about the Christ who is to come? That's what we'd expect to find. And that is what the Old Testament is full of. The Jewish scriptures point towards the incarnate God, the sin-bearing substitute, the Son of God coming for all of us as one of us. And, and here we read that every single week, the daily synagogue reading would have a pointer, a hint. There'd be something in there that points towards the Lord Jesus. That's what Jesus believed. Uh, Jesus said to the religious leaders of his day, you search the scriptures because you think in them you have life. But yet it's them that bear witness to me. And yet you are not coming to me that you might have life. He says there, guys, lads, the whole Bible is about me. Haven't you noticed? Why aren't you like, you know, coming to me when the very scriptures that you claim to love are giving evidence towards me? And then in Luke chapter 24, I love how Jesus, it says, beginning with the Psalms and the prophets and the Moses, he's showing how all of them are pointing towards himself. And so here we see there that Paul says to these religious observers, he's like, this is happening. The prophets write about the Lord Jesus. Verse 28 and 29 tell us more, though. It tells us that Jesus Christ was executed although he was innocent. Um, Pontius Pilate is referenced there. And, and he famously, you know, tried to, to wash his hands of, of this affair, saying that, I, I don't want anything to do with this. I can't condemn this man. Uh, he is innocent. He has done nothing wrong. And that is one voice of many that all agree that Jesus had done nothing worthy of death, nor of any sin whatsoever. But here we read about him, the innocent one is the condemned one. And we read in verse 29, they carried out all that was written of him, and they took him down from the tree, and they laid him in the tomb. Uh, on Good Friday, we, we gathered together in darkness here to commemorate and to remember that mournful day when Christ's body was taken from the cross and laid in the tomb. And, and we finished that Friday night service with to be continued, that there's more to come, that it doesn't end in tragedy, but it ends in triumph. And verse 30 says, but God raised him from the dead. And he goes around, verse 31 talks about how people kept on seeing him, that he <laughs> arranged these meetings with people uh, on some occasions, and that he showed up out of nowhere. And, and Jesus is raised from the dead, but not in invisibility, not spiritually in the hearts of his followers. He still kind of lives on in memory. The Apostle Paul wants these people to know, and what God's Word says that you should know too, is that Jesus actually, literally, bodily rose from death. And that Jesus, he was this public figure, and he was killed publicly. And then he rose from the grave, and then he was seen by a large number of people, people from varying backgrounds. Some of them loved Jesus and believed in him. Some of them didn't. Individuals and crowds at different times, in different ways, Jesus shows up and invites people to inspect that it really, truly is him. He even goes out of his way to say, I'm not like a spirit or a ghost, like, come on, feel, I am really alive once again. And what a contrast between Christianity's start and other religions and how they begin. Uh, so many other religions begin with a, a person has a, a private dream about God, or they have a private meeting with an angel about God, or they have a private idea about God. And then they publicly announce what happened to them in private. Whereas in Christianity, Christ rose from the grave publicly. Christ appeared to crowds. And then the public, the crowd, told other people. Such a difference. Anyway, so anyway, his resurrection was public, 
But then also, didn't you notice that it says there that his resurrection itself was promised in the Old Testament as well? And verse 33 to 37, uh, we see that Paul references, probably by memory, again, he didn't get a chance to prepare this in advance. They're just like, hey, you, do you have anything to say? And he's like, okay. And then he stands up and then he just rattles off some Old Testament scripture. Psalm 2, Isaiah 55, Psalm 16 are, are quoted by memory from the Apostle Paul and they're showing him as hints or as clues or as foreshadowing of the resurrection of Jesus from the grave. Uh, he quotes Psalm 16, which is the same one that the Apostle Peter quoted on the first Christian sermon in Pentecost that says, you will not allow your Holy One to see corruption. Showing that God's plan, that although it was part of God's plan for the Holy One, for the Messiah to die, that he would not be left in the grave to rot, but that he would raise and he would never see corruption. And then here in verse 38, after explaining that the Old Testament is pointing towards this risen Christ, then Paul shifts from education to application. He reminds them of some things they already knew. He informs them of some things that maybe they didn't. But then now he says, here's why it matters. And this is for you. Verse 38. Let it be known to you, therefore, brothers that through this man forgiveness of sins is proclaimed to you. And by him, everyone who believes is freed from everything from which you could not be freed by the law of Moses. I, I got to say, this is his main point. This is our main point. He says, let it be known to you. So he's not talking about them. <laughs> he's not talking about anyone else. And apart from his audience, he's like, you guys need to know this. And there's two things that you need to know. That through Jesus come the forgiveness of sins. And that through Jesus comes freedom from guilt. Wonderful news. Wonderful news. Through this man, forgiveness of sins is proclaimed to you. What is sin? Sin is any act of disobedience that therefore then separates us from God. Um, ancient Christian writers have defined sin as this. All things either in thought, word, or deed that deviate from God's holy, perfect standard. Sin is not only the wrong things that we do do, but it is also the right things that we leave undone. And looking at that expansive, comprehensive definition of, of sin, well, then I, I find myself crushed under the weight of the mountain of Mike's sin. Uh, the weight of that can, can not only crush me, but then drag me to hell for those accumulated sins. But, but here we read, we don't just read about the word sin. Uh, we read about this wonderful combination where it says that through this man, forgiveness of sins is proclaimed to you. And I don't think I could say it any better than, than Charles Spurgeon. And I realize it's been a couple months since I've quoted Spurgeon. Guys, I'm sorry. Let me make up for you. But here we go. Charles Spurgeon just tripped out on this, as, as I did. He says this, The forgiveness of all sins, from your childhood to your old age, the sin of fourscore years, if you lived so long, your public misdemeanors, your private trespasses, your overt acts, your secret thoughts, your unuttered words, your smothered wishes, the whole catalog, all unrolled of your transgressions and iniquities, shall be at once blotted out from the book of God's remembrance if you trust in Christ. They shall not be laid to your charge. However, black the list or long the inventory. Do but trust in this man and they shall all be forgiven you. He that confesses his sin and comes to Jesus shall find mercy. And so the sin that would have and the sin that presently does for those that do not come to Christ separate us from God 
at every good thing for all eternity, those sins, the penalty of those sins, the, the mountainous weight of those sins, well, the Bible tells us that they've been placed upon the cross of Calvary. And that which would have separated me and you from God and every good thing for all eternity separated Christ from the Father for a period of time so that they who are separated by nature, us, can be united by grace through what took place upon the cross. As we trust in Christ, then the transaction upon the cross is credited to our account and that our sins can be forgiven. We can be united with God the Father for eternity because of the brief separation between the Father and the Son that took place on the cross as a gift to you. And so the forgiveness of sins, what a wonderful, what a wonderful main point. But wait, there's more. There's more. Because he doesn't just say through this man forgiveness of sins is proclaimed to you. He goes on to say, and by him everyone who believes is freed from everything from which you could not be freed by the law of Moses. So not just forgiven, but freed from all that you could do, all that you could, sorry, all that you could not do in your efforts at law keeping or moral living. It's wonderful. The resurrection, it gives us two wonderful gifts, forgiveness of sins and justification before the throne of God. You see this word that's used here uh, in, in the, the Greek language, it's this Greek word, dikeo, dikeo. <laughs> and it's, it's translated in the ESV as freed. I wonder, does anyone have an NIV or a New King James? And is it rendered a different way? Or is like everyone ESV now? <laughs> Okay, what's that say? Hmm? Um, verse 38, everyone who believes is... And then the next one? Declared right with God. Uh, if we also look at the NIV or New King James, which apparently no one has today, um, it would say justified. Uh, and so that Greek word dikeo um, is rendered as justified like the other 37 times uh, that it appears in the New Testament. Uh, it's one of Paul's favorite words. And then here we see his first sermon. He uses that word. He speaks about being justified before God. Um, and justification is the act of God whereby God declares the believing sinner to be righteous in his eyes. Uh, we are absolved, we are clear and freed from every charge against us. It's like every sin of ours is taken away. That is forgiveness. But it's as if all of the righteousness of the Lord Jesus Christ is then copied and pasted into our account. So forgiveness is like, you know, control A, delete. All of our sins forgiven off the spreadsheet. And then justification is like control A, copy and paste. Do you guys use computers? Um, <laughs> I do. Um, and and it's, like, it's like his his righteousness is credited to us. And so isn't that what we could talk about it in, 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 um, in monetary terms or debt? To be forgiven of your debt means that you don't owe the creditors any longer. But then to be justified means that someone else's bank account is then deposited into yours. Now say, I'd love to be just forgiven. But like, isn't it great that we're forgiven and justified as well? So Paul writes the book of Galatians. Paul writes the book of Romans to unpack more and more and more of what it means to be justified. But here he says, it's from the resurrection. In Romans chapter 4, Paul writes that Jesus was delivered over to death for our sins and that he was raised for our justification. 
So Paul says they're connected. There's a hymn that I, I, I love, and there's a line in it that says, the vilest offender who truly believes that moment from Jesus a pardon receives. And I gotta say, I love that line. The vilest offender who truly believes that moment from Jesus a pardon receives. It, it, it chokes me up more than once. I, I, I think, you know, that's me. That's me. I am the vilest offender and I have been pardoned. The moment of my faith in Christ was the moment that I received my pardon. It's wonderful and it's true. But I would, I would say, as much as I love that song and I love that line, I'd say it's true, but it's not true enough. It's more than just I've been pardoned, but it's also I'm justified in God's sight. So Jesus did not come only to forgive us, but we're also justified. So the debt is taken care of and the credit is given to us. And, and so here, the Apostle uh, Paul, when he preaches this to his congregation in Pisidian Antioch, and as I get to preach uh, to Cork, uh, I'm saying, let this be known to you that this is, that this is available, that this is for you. And, and so for, for those of you that, that mightn't know Christ personally, it says there that the one who believes is freed from all these things. That means that if you do not believe, then you are not freed. Then you are not justified nor forgiven. And so there's a terrible solemnity that um, also undergirds our resurrection celebration on this Easter Sunday. And so I would say, for those of you, you, you are invited, you must believe in order to be freed in order to be justified, in order to be forgiven. And, and it can happen in a moment. It could happen right now. As you say, Jesus, this is true, and I've, I've been around you, and I've attended church, and I've you know, muttered along with some songs, or this is new to me, but, but I believe that you've risen from the dead for the forgiveness of my sins and for the justification of, of my standing before the Father. And that moment, a pardon receives and justification is given. So you're invited. But then the Apostle Paul, he says that. And then, verse 40, he also gives a word of warning against refusal. He says, there, therefore, beware, lest what's said in the prophets should come about. You know, look, you scoffers, be astounded and perish from doing a work in your days, a work that you will not believe even if one tells it to you. Uh, here, he's quoting the book of Habakkuk, which is about 600 years prior to, to this time. Uh, and he is referencing a time in Israel's history when they were disbelieving God, when they were disobeying God. And, and so God sent a, uh, a judgment upon them for their refusal to hear and to heed God's word. And so Paul is saying that if, if that happened for refusing God 600 years ago, then what's going to happen about refusing the Son of God, the Christ who's come and died and raised for our forgiveness and justification? And so I'm just going to borrow that from him and just say for us today, well then, what, what would happen for us to take that, that generous offer and just say, no thanks, or I'm grand, or I don't need that, or I'll be okay on my own, thank you. Jesus absorbed God's wrath for our sin upon the cross. And then through faith, we benefit from that payment. But apart from faith, if we reject that offer, well, then that bill is given to us. Then we have to pay it and face the darkness of God's wrath. So Paul warns his hearers, and I, I warn you, what a great offer. But there also is a warning that comes with it. And so consider yourselves warned. But then we continue on. Verse 42 and, and following, I'm going to have to summarize. It says, as they went out, the people begged that these things might be told of them the next Sabbath. And that meeting broke up and um, many Jews and devout converts followed Paul and Barnabas and they spoke with them and they, and I love what Paul and Barnabas did. They urged them to continue in the grace of God. And so then the next Sabbath, it says this, nearly the whole city gathered to hear the word of the Lord. Just, could we just underline that and pray that that would happen in Cork? Wouldn't that be great? 
But, but when they saw the crowds, there was this, you know, people were reviling, and there was this hubbub. Um, and then, essentially, I, I'm, I'm summarizing this, that, that things got crazy afterwards. Some people loved it. Some people wanted to hear more. Uh, but certain people said, no, we, we don't want this. We are rejecting you. We're rejecting your message. And, and from that point on, uh, we see that Paul and Barnabas, they focus then upon the Gentiles, upon the non-Jewish people, the, the pagans, the, the ones that were all, you know, not nice and religious, like how they thought they were. Um, they said, you know what, if, if you guys don't want it, then, then we're going to bring it to these other group of people. He says in verse 47, the Lord commanded us, saying, I've made you a light for the Gentiles, that you may bring salvation to the ends of the earth. Verse 48, when the Gentiles heard this, they began rejoicing and glorifying the word of the Lord. And then it continues on and it goes over, it's just, just great. But here we see here that the people who should have been the most prepared and the people who were the most upright, the people that were attending religious services very faithfully, they were not interested. They were, in fact, were the most opposed. And Paul says, well, then I'm going to go to the unlikely, to the surprising choice of people that are not like me and not like you, and they're going to accept this, and they're going to hear it with gladness. And so the people that, I guess, were standing on the outskirts, the people that didn't even want to, to, to darken the doors of a synagogue, I guess, he says, well, those are the ones that are going to be hearing uh, the message from this point on. And so we close with this reminder that this message of Christ is not just for the Jews, it's not just for the religion, it's the religious, it's for all people. And so here we see uh, Paul, in essence, going to those unlikely choices. And we've seen this week after week lately, that God is just so pleased to find untrained and unlikely and uncultured people and, and use them for his glory. And, and so here, I, I want to appeal to you guys again. Um, Maybe as you heard <clears throat> about the forgiveness of sins and justification and how it's there for those that have faith in Christ, maybe you're thinking, well, that's not me because of this and this and this. Or I am too old. Or I am too young. Or I am too bad. Or I am too good. I'm too educated for all this. Or I'm not smart enough for all of this. I'm too poor, I'm too rich, I'm too pure, I'm too defiled to accept and to receive Christ's offer. And so, second chance, coming around again. The unlikely people are the ones that received and benefited from this. And the unlikely people were the ones that Paul focused on from then on out. And so, if a few moments ago you thought, that's really not what I'm... I'm, I'm in for, or I'm able to, or I'm too far gone, or I haven't even started enough, well then I would say then you are exactly qualified because it's the unlikely that are chosen again and again and again and again and again and again and again. And so with that, we have Paul's first sermon and my most recent one, I don't want to say last, <laughs> and my most recent one, just borrowing his wonderful presentation of the gospel, that God has been at work amongst the history of the Israelite nation on this Christward trajectory. And then Christ has come, the son of David, the one that's greater than John the Baptist, the one that's spoken of in the prophets, the one that has been executed, though innocent, the one that's been raised from the dead. He is the one who gives forgiveness of sins and freedom from guilt. And it's for those of any background who accept and believe. And that's the wonderful message of the resurrection of Christ. And so we're going to celebrate that. So we're going to continue on in song. Today is the only Sunday in the year that we don't have communion. Um, we had it on Good Friday. And this is a time for us, not especially to remember his death, but to celebrate his life. And so what an opportunity for us to, to stand, to sing, to lift our voices, to lift our hands, to bend our knees, to close our eyes, what, whatever is, is appropriate for just to say, thank you, Lord. And then also, 
I'm going to be in the back. Um, if, if, you're, if you want to take up this wonderful offer, then in the quietness of your heart, it might already have happened, but if you want to talk to somebody about it, well, then I'd, I'd love to. I'll be there in the back. So I'm going to pray, and then Dave and the musicians are going to lead us in four songs. So, Father, thank you so much for um, this great story of Jesus Christ that, as we can see, it, it goes back so much further than many people imagine. And then also that it continues on forever, that he is the deathless king, that he was dead but now is alive forevermore, as Revelation 1.8 says. You are the Alpha and the Omega. Thank you so much for uh, Christ Jesus. And Lord, I, I pray that all of us, Lord, uh, would have a deeper and a wider um, appreciation of who he is. Lord, thank you for forgiveness of sins. Thank you for, for freedom for guilt. We love you. We thank you. In Jesus' name, amen.